All right, I'd, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 968th monthly meeting of FATMOB. Our guest speaker will be Dr. Razia Imani. Our talk will be about multi-scale and multi-frequency study of galaxy evolution and active galactic nuclei feedback. There we go. Uh, we have a very sort of standard, typical agenda. Well, anyway, I don't know what you guys, but I love this time of year. Oh, it's so dark, so early. This is fabulous. I think it's fantastic. And so uh, this, I, I put this over uh, Glenn's silly cartoons uh, because I thought this was much more appropriate. But um, look, there we are. It's us. That's us. I love it when it gets dark early in the evening because it gives us more time to observe in the, uh, uh, you know, before it gets too late. I'm at this age. I'm good for about three to four hours and then i have to stop i'm just too tired and in the summertime that's like yeah you know, it's two in the morning it makes it for you know i mean i don't have a lot to do the next day but it's a late night so i'm really psyched that we're here so let's go to the next slide sure. gonna work the slides for me the one on the um, left is looking at deep sky the one on the right is looking at the moon <laughs> and I'm, I'm like both almost, you know so there there was some animation here but i guess it didn't transfer over so these are glenn's jokes for the week i was going to have you know, click the button and the answer would come up. But there you go. Um, why is the moon rock taster than the earth rock? How do astronomers organize a party? And um, I don't know where Glenn got these silly jokes, but he was going to blame Sal for them. But, uh, <laughs> I, uh, so, I don't know. Anyway, next slide, next slide. So here's our work. Uh, these, this is the observing schedule. Again, we, we try to um, have um, duty roster folks up there for the dark of the moon, whether it's our, near the third, last quarter moon or new moon. Um, and so there they are for the rest of the year. I've already put together a roster of duty assignments for the coming year. And I also sent out an email this afternoon inviting anybody new to that if they would like to join us and I can put them on the roster. So I've got a couple of folks have already replied to that. Um, I'll publish that soon. I'll send you a copy so we can put it in the newsletter. And um, so that's 2024 already mapped out. So it, it's also on the event calendar every week, to, every month also. Rich, did you say that you already sent out the roster? Nope, not yet. I'm just, I'm just putting the finishing touches on it. And so I'll send it out hopefully by the end of November, at least one form of it. I'm with new people involved. Um, and that way you've got, you'll have a heads up. I, I don't like to spring things on people with like a week to go. So that'll, that'll be coming soon. All right, next slide. So there, there was some sort of an eclipse of the sun last month, and um, yeah. some of us travel <laughs> some of us travel far and wide, and some of, yeah, I can I can work the clicker if you want. Some of us traveled far and wide, some of us uh, stayed home, and so um, it was a Saturday. Uh, the further south you were in New England, the cloudier it was. Um, I chose to watch it from my driveway with a, a, a an astronomy friend, and um, we saw the first maybe ten minutes of the eclipse, and then it got awfully cloudy, awfully fast. But um, there are, here are some shots. This one was taken by Mark Helton. Very nice. Mark's up on the North Shore, so it was clearer up on the North Shore. Um, here's one from Nasmus. I was going to rotate them so they'd be in the same di direction, but that's okay. Here's one from Doug Paul. That's what it looked like from my yard. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much what I saw most of the afternoon. Um, Jeffrey Alexander shot this one. Nice. Um, Here's uh, Al Takeda. Um, again, you know, this is a, oh, there's the light. This one here looks, you can see, you can see how cloudy this is um, because of all the haze. But, and I love this. I actually really like that. Look at that. There it is. Sort of like first contact. Very, and here's a, here's a close up right there. Look at that. Look at that. I love it. Then, um, Gary Walensky shot this. Must have been far away because there's a nice shot of the angularity. Very nice. Where was uh, it? Where Bruce Berger. Well, uh, Bruce Berger's uh, guerrilla astronomy trip to um, Houston. Was it Houston? San Antonio. San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And in the morning, out in the afternoon, sort of like that, right? Uh, <clears throat> we decided to go at 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. We got on a 7 p.m. flight, arrived in San Antonio at 12.30 a.m., slept for a few hours, got up at about 7.30, found a place to observe from, set up, 10 o'clock, ready to go, watched the clouds come in and screw the whole sky up. 
<laughs> did you get some good results? No, we did. Um, you can see clouds in a lot of these. Yep. But for the most part, it was clear, and we shot enough. We were uh, we left for the airport at 3 p.m. Got to the airport, the Del Delta terminal, bought tickets home, and we were home at one in the morning. I love it. Absolutely love it. That's the way to go to an eclipse. Now, the other way. I don't know about that. <laughs> That's what we're going to no, the other way. Um, this guy took some pictures too. So Mario, you were gone for like a week, right? Yeah. And where did where'd you ultimately watch um, observe from? Well, looking at the, unlike some people who decide to go the day before, <laughs> I planned this a couple of years in advance. <laughs> Albuquerque, the, uh, the center line passed right through it, and my, I told my wife we got to find a place to stay, and she she found this. From my map, she found a hotel called the San Antonio Inn. It was the literally the line goes right through the hotel. Nice. <laughs> That's where we were. Great. That's perfect. Of course, if you're on the center line, at the, at the moment of greatest eclipse, you have a perfectly symmetrical That's ring the around center the center picture. Yeah. yeah. That's the picture. That, that, perfect. This this is how you know he was on the center line. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been you know like this only you know annular. We didn't quite get that. Good in San Antonio. It was close, but yeah, that's great. We're fully closed, but not totally on the center. Nice job. So, of course, you, you know the next eclipse is the uh, the big one, the Great American Eclipse of 2024. And um, they're expecting 40 million people to be in the path of totality. Um, so, um, good luck with that. I, I, um, <laughs> yeah, good luck. That's all I can say. Weather prospects are, are mediocre at best. Yeah, but don't miss it because the next one oh, in the U.S. The next one in the U.S. What's that? 2043. Right. Well, no, 2044 is in the Pacific Northwest. 2045 is the next one that comes up through the country. 2045. I've already mapped it up because I'll be, I'm probably going to have to skip that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll miss that one. Those over here, yeah. you if you're looking for accommodations, um, the AMC has a space that opened up. Come on. Say AMC, again? AMC, a lot of the SDS people are going. The ANC and there's a space up in the picture. Okay. For next year? Yeah, in April. Cool. Well, I wish you the best. There are other eclipses you can get to, except they're far across in the, the waters. I'm, I, I'm actually thinking about the 2027 eclipse in Egypt. Yes. Because I'd really like to see the pyramids. So, so if there was any travel plan on my bucket list, it would be to see the pyramids. Yeah. And that would be the, that would be the one to go to. And in totality in 2027 is. Over six minutes. Six and a half minutes. So it's a long one. It's a part of that Saros uh, that is, gives us long eclipses. Anyway, so that's coming up. Now, closer to home, well, not closer to home. Sure, closer to home. John Boudreau published this the other day. He sent an email out the other day. Um, John takes some amazing planetary images with his, um, his 14 and a half inch doll Kirkman. And what he did was in, in infrared wavelengths. He was able to catch capture detail on the night side of Venus. Ooh, God. And so this is the overexposed, um, you know, the sunlit side of Venus. And here is part of the, the nighttime side of Venus glowing in the infrared. To compare it to this simulation as to what he would have seen, you can see some of the features here. You know, this bright area here is right here, and there's this little dark area here that extends to there. Pretty cool. Wow. I just wanted to I'll show you what he's doing. He takes some amazing images. Of, uh, of planets, and this I was particularly I'm tickled by this one, so I asked him if we could include it in the slide deck, and he's like, "Sure, go ahead." Um, amazing. Is that what his methane filter? I'm sorry. Is that what his methane filter? Um, 1.01 micron. Yeah, no, it's some infrared thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's infrared. Yeah. Very cool. It's a CWL filter stack. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what any of that means. The imager people would have to tell me. Pretty long. <laughs> anyway, nice job, John. Nice job if you're out there listening in. Anyway, so here are the uh, observer highlights for the month on the planet roundup. Um, Venus is brilliant in the morning sky still. Um, I, I don't know if you were up early enough the other morning to see the moon nearby uh, Venus. There was an occultation today, this morning, but it was over in Europe, so I didn't even bother to, to tell you about that. But right now it's about minus 4.2 magnitude, it's 65% illuminated. Still about 46 degrees from the sun. You know what that means, right? Get out in the daytime and look for it in the daylight. You'll be able to find it easily. Saturn is well placed at sunset. Ring tilts about 10 degrees. Neptune is at magnitude plus 7.8 um, near the the uh, the, the uh, circlet of Pisces. 
Um, Uranus is near Jupiter, plus 5.7. Jupiter reached opposition on November 3rd at magnitude minus 2.9, currently culminating about 11 o'clock, 60 degrees in altitude. Um, take advantage of that because it's, it's what well, does that mean? Currently culminating uh, it's when it transits, the, when it's at its highest peak in the point in the sky. Okay. So when it's on the meridian, it's standing about sure. 60 degrees above the southern horizon, really good. which is yeah. which is pretty high up. Pretty high, yeah. If you go and look at it, crank up the magnification <clears throat> to as much as the atmosphere will allow you to, and then look at the Galilean satellites and and, and embrace them. All right, they're not points of light; they're little tiny disks. And if you really pay attention, um, you can look at different um, sizes of the disks. You can look at the different colors of the disks. And you can even look at the albedo features. Callisto is particularly dull because it only reflects about like 35% of the light that hits it. So it, when you line up those moons, you can tell Callisto in a heartbeat because first of all, it's big and it's dull. And you can go, oh, that's Callisto. And Ganymede is bright and big and the other two are, you know, you figure them out. It's pretty cool. Um, you know I give you all kinds of information on the 19 plus objects every month um, uh, about what you can see in the sky. Um, also, I include um, uh, Jupiter events, uh, shadow transits, and great red spot um, crossing Jupiter, Jupiter's meridian. The red spot is particularly interesting these days. Um, this is a picture by Christopher Goh, guy that lives in the Philippines, does some amazing, amazing imaging of the planets. And what I want to call your attention to is that, well, there's the red spot, right? And there's the South Equatorial Belt, and you can see that lump over, the, over this storm here. But the other night I was looking at these three ovals, and they are particularly visible right now. They're, they're really easy to see. Um, I was using about 250 power on a 12 inch soap, and they were really easy to see, especially when the air steadies up. I like to use a light blue filter, an 80A filter, when I observe Jupiter. Um, it'll look blue at first, but once your eye figures that out, it'll look just gray, and the features are much easier to see, I think. But um, those ovals, these guys right here, were really easy to see the other night. They just it, it produced a wealth of detail in this, in this region of Jupiter. So um, I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that to give you more of an incentive to go out and look at these things. All right, most of the GRS um, transits I post in that little thing I mailed to you guys are, are conveniently timed, right, in the evening hours. So you don't have to get up at like three in the morning to see it. But um, yeah, I wholeheartedly recommend you get out there and look at that. Fabulous stuff, fabulous. The variable star of the month is Mira, Omicron SETI. Now, here's the AVSO chart. It has, it's a pulsating variable with a period of about 335 days. And if you look along the bottom here on the X axis, what you'll notice is in, in Julian, uh, in uh, calendar days, here we are out here. Um, it's near its minimum value of about eighth to ninth magnitude. So why am I including this here? Well, because I want you to watch it through the winter time. As it, as it gets, um, as, as this curve starts to turn around and sweep upward here, uh, before it's lost in the glare of the sun over here, um, it, it should, you know, maybe, we'll, maybe it'll reach naked eye visibility. Now, yeah. There's another good reason to look at it now. When it's bright, it's kind of an orangey red, yep. but right now it's blood red. But these, very, these red stars that are variable are most intensely colored when they're at their minimum value. And, and a couple of perfect examples, my favorite examples, are Laporis. Our Laporis is going to be my, probably for December, my, you know, variable star of the month. And our Laporis, when, when it's at its minimum of, gosh, somewhere down around 11th magnitude, if you can find it, it is unbelievably red. It was like one of the reddest stars you'll ever see in the sky. The first night I looked for it, with a 20-inch reflector, I couldn't even see it. I, had, I went into the house to find, get a finder chart. Because I couldn't, I figured I must be on the wrong field. Nope, nope, I was spot on it. It's just such a red star, I didn't pick it up at first. Um, it's just an amazing star to look at. So these, you're right, Mario, these things are best when they're viewed at minimum. So watch that all winter long. Um, the double star of the month is one that Glenn mentioned um, last month, Gamma Aridus, Mesothrum. Um, very pretty, 3.9, 4.6, are separated by 7.4 arc seconds. Um, that's a nice one. Easy to find, right? Here are the stars of Aries. It's right there. So that's a really, really pretty double star to look at. They're um, uh, A2, uh, to both main sequence stars, they're, they're white. Um, so they're a pair of uh, almost equally bright white stars. Really pretty to look at. So that's your double star of the month. Let's see, keep moving forward here. 
Observers Challenge for November of 2023, IC10. Has anybody seen that yet? I, I did. Um, we were at the clubhouse uh, the other night, and John Bishop had his, uh, his um, Takahashi Mulan 210 um, doll Kirkman set up, and we could actually see it. Um, it was hard, and it was faint, but we could actually see it. From framing him, I tried with a, a variety of scopes, and I, I couldn't see anything of it. But it is visible. It's easy to find. I mean, here's, here's Cassiopeia, and it's, it's right there. It's marked on pretty much every star atlas you can get your hands on. And when you image it, it looks pretty good. Um, the, this triangle of stars right here will let you know you're on your mark. When you find this triangle of stars, and as you star hop to this area, um, the part that's easiest to see is in here. Um, I, we couldn't see any of this stuff over here. But that's a nice shot from Doug Paul. Here's one from Mario. I like the um, I like the pink. <clears throat> star. Well, that was red, green, blue, and then I did an hour's worth of H alpha. That okay, was, and that's that's, that's what brings such that a up. puny little irregular galaxy. <laughs> yep, it it's has um, an incredible amount of H alpha detail. It's it's part of the local group. It's only a couple of million light years away, right. but but lying behind the stars of Cassiopeia, it's it's um it's obscured by the Milky Way which makes it a, a really challenging object to see visually. But nice job, Mario, that's nice. And then here's, here's a picture that Chris took with the, the middleman, which is just fabulous. Mm -hmm. And again, here, the, here's that. Doing an H alpha on top of that. Here's the triangle of stars to look at. When you find this triangle, you know you're right there, but not, now try to see that. Um, pretty challenging. Um, but for, and even more challenging is the, the Sol Nebula. Um, I see 1848. It's got a star cluster, which is relatively easy. And this is the Sol Nebula here. That's the Heart Nebula. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there's a Sol Nebula. I've never seen either of these visually. Um, uh, Slav was up at the clubhouse one night with his, um, with his um, uh, night vision scope. Mm -hmm. And he came over to me, asked me if I'd ever seen Barnard's ring. And I was like, no. He said, well, look through this. And so I put it up to my eyes. And he had an H alpha filter on it, too. And, and there was Barnard's ring right there, it's just jumping out of the sky at you. So I was like, can I look around with this? Can I use this for a second? The Rosette Nebula was spectacular. These two things were just like leaping out of the sky at me. I couldn't believe how big the California Nebula actually is. I'd never seen that before. So I handed it back to him. It's like a $5,000 piece of equipment. I'm like, thanks. I, like, I love playing with your toy. Thank you. Um, and then I moved on to other things. But um, try this one. I, I, I think you need really dark skies to see it. But there it is, and these are some. It's not that hard to image, though. Well, no, <laughs> no. That's only an hour. Okay. Uh, however, that's with an f two point zero lens. Okay. Yep, I know. Listen, yeah. I, I marvel when I go when I go to Maine with Bruce and Babette and and see what what single lens you know the DLS is that what they're called the DLSR? DLSR. 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 I don't even know the acronyms from all you imaging people. I just look through my telescope, right? Put an eyepiece in. I got eyepieces, but I actually put in my telescope and you can eye to see. I still have a couple of them. <laughs> but but, but what, what today's cameras are capable of um, are, are doing, whether they're you know astro nightscape cameras or stuff you hook up to a telescope, fabulous. Unbelievable where we've come in imaging capabilities in the backyard. It's just fabulous. Um, well, here are some of the here are some of the specs. I see 10. Not even listed in um, uh, in Kepler uh, Sander. Uh, I see eighteen forty eight is three stars for the cluster, one star for the, the nebulosity. And coming up in January, Galaxy and see this NGC nine thirty six is given three stars. Tenth magnitude galaxy, probably probably okay. I don't know why it's a challenge. I haven't looked for it yet, but these are some of the things that up and coming. Roger just Robert Ivester just published his um, uh, the list of twenty twenty four objects. Um, some lovely things to look at. Um, there's a galaxy in Lyra that we, I, I looked at, uh, very lovely. Um, there are a few others I've already taken a peek at, um, pretty good stuff. Um, so there are fun things to come up with. So I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Razia Mami. Uh, she'll be talking about um, multi-scale and multi-frequency study of galaxy evolution and active galactic nuclei feedback. Razia Imami is a postdoc research associate here at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. She got her PhD in 2015, joined the CFA in 2018, first as an 
Institute for Theory and Computational Postdoc Fellow, and then as a research associate. She's a member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration and works on the black hole imaging and spectral analysis. She also focuses on running and analyzing cosmological simulations and on the active galactic nuclei feedback. In this talk, Dr. Razia Amani will speak about the prospects of the co-evolution of uh, supermassive black holes and their host galaxies, together with different observational signatures of the active galactic nuclei feedbacks. So please welcome our guest speaker. Uh, it's my great pleasure to give you a presentation tonight. Thank you so much for your invitation. And I'm really sorry for being slightly late. As I've been described, I had good reason for it. And I'm very happy that it worked out. So the problem was that not only that was a very beautiful rainy day today, but I also had some rain actually appearing in my laptop. So my system is actually crashed in the morning. And that was all because of the friendliness of my actually Smithsonian people that they helped me out very quickly to fix the problem. And consequently, I have SIS to show because all the files on my computer just went away. So about two minutes before I come, my SR pre like preparation is over and I'm happy to present it. So after all of it, let's just stop with the science. So I'm going to talk about the multi-scale and multi-frequency probe of the AGM feedback today and tonight. And you know, as I've described, this is a very active science that a lot of astronomers today are doing and we actually are going to continue over the next decade or so when we have multiple more telescopes around the world. So let me just start with actually the main question or the main topic. The fact is that cosmic evolution is very involved. So it's the problem is that, you know, we are actually considering a multi-scale, multi-basically epoch analysis that actually goes through all the way from the Big Bang to today. And there are lots and lots of the physics that I can just not really talk about all of them tonight. But the fact is that, you know, uh, basically, sorry, I, I also hear my echo, so I to basically cancel the voice. So we are not going to basically go all the way from the Big Bang to today, but there are various different ways that you could maybe connect them across each other, across different times, across different scales, using different telescopes. And we were very lucky that from the last scattering surface that was happening from the basically CMB up to the formation of the first stars, to the formation of the galaxies, and to the galaxy evolution, we have a very wide range of different scales and different telescopes today that we could just try to start grabbing, actually digesting what has happened from the beginning of the universe. So it actually has all the way from Big Bang to today. And the question is that how the universe that we are seeing today was origin originated basically 13 billion years ago and how it actually got evolved. What are the key physics that were basically controlling the formation and evolution of the universe? So needless to say, this is very, very, very challenging. And that's exactly how you see that there are so many different set telescopes at different bands, but this is actually the electromagnetic spectrum that you see there are basically telescope for radio, for basically infrared, for the visible universe, for the basically IR and actually, so that's like infrared, basically visible, the UV, the X-ray and gamma rays. And this is actually what all they are going to do is that in their wavelengths and their, in their actually capacity, they are going to basically look at some part of the sky and just try to see what's really going on. So this is really similar to actually, okay, so before I go to the telescopes before, so I'm going to say that in addition to all of those observational efforts, there are also some theoretical predictions. So we are very lucky that we have all of these hydrodynamical simulations, so I'm part of the actually collaborations that my collaborators and my advisors are part of the illustrious CNG or the pure of the illustrious CNG. And that actually took them several decades to come up with some uh, consistent theory of the basically galaxy formation and evolution. And you see that in the left there are some something that we call them Earth-type universe or Earth-type actually galaxies. And here, the late-type galaxies. 
that you see that the structures and the formations and the time that are actually forming is very different. So before all of those telescopes and capacities that are just talking about them during this talk, they actually come to exist, we had a very good theoretical predictions, but they were not actually anywhere onto basically being comparing or conclusive. You could have just said, okay, what would happen if you start very early on in your galaxy formation, you have some seeds of the galaxy, they would start forming, but then afterward there will be some mergers, then basically star formation sometimes get basically a stop, you have the quiz and quiescent galaxies, you, so you actually get the quenching of the galaxies, you have some mergers, you have disruptions, and so on and so forth. So all of them, until very recently, were only predictions that the theory could actually potentially give, basically give it to us. And needless to say, all of these theoretical, basically, you know, computations, there are lots and lots of assumptions. There are lots and lots of parameters. So they are not very compelling. They are not going to tell you, you know, what is actually the size of this universe. You can just assume something for it. Or you can just assume something for the, basically, galaxy formation model or the evolution. And that would basically control how the size of the universe or how, the, how does the actually size of individual objects would basically form. You have to come up with some assumptions or modelings for how the black holes actually get seeded. What is their black hole mass? What is the feedback that the black hole actually basically put to the galaxy? And I will define it in a moment. So there are lots and lots of uh, assumptions here. And that's exactly the difficulty. So you basically, you assume something and you get something else. So, and that was actually the logo of the TNG that you just saw. So, um, you know, despite the fact that there have been a lot of efforts and a lot of other taken actually in this modeling and evolutions, there were a lot of questions left. So again, this is a very involved field actually. So that's basically the, you know, uh, the benefits of having all of these basically different telescopes. They start from the radio, go to the near IR and go to the basically optics and go to the basically UV and actually X-ray and gamma ray. And you can also have some multi-frequency analysis. So only then you start grabbing a little bit more about the actually big question, which is what is the elephant in the room? Again, we cannot really model the entire of the elephant. That's actually equivalent to saying that we cannot really model the entire of the universe. But what we could potentially do is that we just use all of different telescopes at different times, at different scales, and we just try to understand what's going on. We just try to model them one by one. Different parts of the elephant would be associated with different scales. And you can also argue it's not only one elephant, because the question of the galaxy formation and evolution is mostly part multi-scale. So you could imagine that you have many different elephants from the beginning of the universe up, 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 up actually until today. And in fact, these elephants can maybe size, you know, change their size, change their colors, they may actually get converted to lion or other things. So this is very, very complicated. And all what we need to do is just like try to actually digest what we happen for individual telescopes and then try to hope that we can actually at some point connect them together to multi-frequency analysis or at least try to see if we actually propose something for the size of the black hole or for the accretion to the black hole or the jet power, what would it actually imply when you go to the galaxy scale in terms of the feedback, in terms of the ejections of the matter, in terms of the star formation, cases and actually quest of the galaxies and go all the way to the galaxy clusters and again see their basically, um, you know, signatures and so on and so forth. So in fact, unfortunately, we cannot really detect everything, but we are actually confident that we're using this multi-frequency analysis, multi-scale analysis, we can try to combine all of the elephants in the universe and try to get a good feeling about how the universe was originated and how it actually started evolving toward the basically what we have today. And it's even more important because as you see, we don't really know what would be the fate of the universe. I never knew that my laptop would crash today. So if I knew it, I had already started making my slides yesterday. I'm just like kidding, but that's exactly the point. I was very lucky that people helped me out, but we may not be very lucky if we don't know the face of the universe. 
So we may get completely basically surprised if we see that at some point we will collapse and we just say they're all of us. So it's really important, not, in term, not only in terms of the curiosity about the fundamental questions in the world that how the universe was originated, how it actually started evolving up to today, but also what is the fate of the universe, which is another very, very compelling and very involved question that nobody really knows the answer to. That one is even more important and more actually complex compared to here because we have data for now, but we have never actually have any data for future. So with all of it, I'm going to motivate using the multi-frequency analysis, unfortunately not for tomorrow, but at least for what have happened until today, just to get a good sense of the structures and the universe, the origin, the evolutions, and all of the fundamental questions that people have actually worked up for decades to understand them. So we are lucky that basically astronomy is, uh, has been converted to a precise you know, basically science most recently, thanks to all of the developments that different telescopes have actually provided for us. So with that note, let me start with basically, uh, you know, start with the first word in my talk, which is the Adrian feedback, what it is. So there are a lot of evidence that galaxies, they host black holes. So when you have a heavy object at the center of the basically galaxy, they start accreting and accreting and accreting further and further. So when they start accreting and when they, when they actually continue accreting more materials to them, at some points they get so powerful that they eject the materials out. And that's exactly in the phase that they are very active in their accretion, we just call them AGM, active galactic nuclei. And when they expect a lot of materials out, because they were already actually gathering a lot of things inside, we just call them AGM feedback. So this feedback, actually refers to ejections of the materials, outflow, other basically neutral or ionized materials that they try to actually interact with the IGM around the basically, uh, you know, around the galaxies and they try to basically change something in the galaxy morphology. For instance, you may have some galaxies that are star forming before all of these ejections happening, but then since these are very hot, also depending on their modes, whether they are thermal or kinetic. This is a little bit more technical, I'm not going to go through them, but in terms of how energetic they are, they may actually change the structures and morphology of the basic galaxy. So you would actually convert a very nice spiral, a star forming galaxy, to an elliptical galaxy which is dead. Or in another word, the air type universe, actually air type galaxies go to the light type galaxies and vice versa. So this is very important to see what is the matter content of those ejecta and how we could actually probe them. So that's basically, since they are, these are going to go from basically inner part of the galaxy all the way to the outer part of the galaxy, then it's important to see how much we can probe them, how much we can understand them. And that's exactly the basically benefits of using this multi-scale, multi-frequency analysis. So in the continuation of this talk, I am going to actually go one by one to different telescopes, different basically uh, bands, different frequencies, and just try to see what we learn about this actually ejection that is really coming from those accretions, those total basically disruption of the stars and gas and so on that were just really like accreted by the black hole. So this is basically, I hope that this is the good motivation and the outline of this talk. So if you have any question, please ask me anytime. If not, let me just start with actually uh, with the basically very nice uh, significations of the, what we actually see in this multi-frequency business. So I really apologize to our friends uh, basically online, but I feel like that it's good that we actually basically show this one. So let me just stop talking and you would actually see what's going on here. So let me stop here. So in fact, what we are seeing is actually sonifications of different wetlands. And some of our colleagues, I'm part of the ESG collaboration, as I'll be described in a moment, they really did a nice job to try to say that if you have a galaxy and you just sort of monitor them 
at different frequencies, how this actually sound that different colors refer to whether you are near IR or if actually you are basically infrared or actually X-ray, what would be the sound if you just try to convert them to sound you would actually see? So let me start again. You saw how the oh okay, so you saw how the X-ray actually look like. So again, this motivates us that the sounds is different, the structures that you actually see, multi frequency is different, and thus the science explorations and science actually outcome will be different. So with that note, let me actually start with basically multi scale analysis of the black hole. So I start with something I'm more familiar with, which is the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And that's actually in the radio. So basically, quite recently, I joined the EHT, and that's actually uh, basically uh, the Smithsonian Castle when we uh, discovered the uh, images of the black hole. Basically, okay, that's actually the Saturn star that uh, we actually in 2021 we were able to see. I'm sure that a lot of you guys have seen this, and a lot of news basically papers around the world they actually see it. But then that was because of the actually EHD collaboration. And what is the EHD? So EHD actually refers to an array of different telescopes around the world that in the millimeter, 1.3 millimeter, they are going to actually monitor the universe. So you see the bunch of them. And why do we want to see them? Because we want to resolve the black holes, which are very, 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 very far away from us. So in fact, actually, in order to basically come up with uh, some resolutions that really goes to the event horizon of the, of the black holes, you have to come up with something with the telescopes that actually consider to have the diameter of order of the air size, which is almost impossible. You cannot have a basically telescope which is basically equal to the you know, diameter of the Earth. So what you could do instead is that you just try to connect a lot of different meter telescopes that each of them are like quite a few meters around the world, and you just try to sim basically simulate them or actually stimulate them so that when you actually observe some of them through some atomic clock or so, their basically signal would be in the, you know, basically instantaneous. So in this case, that array of the telescope is actually called basically EHD. That, as you see, they were quite in 2017, we had about seven or actually, you know, quite a few of them, but now we are basically, you know, uh, progressively increasing them. And the next generation of the Event Horizon Telescope, they are going to go even up to 20 ish or actually more, depending on a lot of different things that sometimes you can actually also have something in South Africa and so on. But at the end of the day, the connection of all of these telescopes would basically, yeah, in a moment, would actually allow us to observe the event horizon of the telescopes in a very, basically, a good accuracy. So I see a hand over there. Do you, do you have a question? I'm wondering whether anybody is yet uh, thinking or talking about putting a dish on the moon. Yeah, I mean, there are actually, you know, there are some people that are going to uh, basically talk about this, you know, but the fact is that these things, I mean, the technology, you have to build them up, and yeah, I mean, people are really thinking. Those space telescopes and actually 21 centimeters, some people are really thinking to put them, and yeah, I mean, I don't really know at the end of the day how basically, uh, how, how quickly you can get all of those, because, you know, you know, it is people have all of these facilities through NASA to go to the moon, right? But really, when it happens, I really don't know. But that's a great idea. And in fact, um, yeah, so I'll get back to you. In fact, that's an excellent question because that would allow us to basically resolve them even further. And that's actually part of the things that we can still not really resolve them in the black course. If you really go to that scale, you can actually, if you really add basically something which is not on the Earth, but somewhere else, that would basically increase the length of your, you know, of your actually interferometry. So the diameter here would actually, you know, extensively basically get, you know, get enlarged actually. And that means that the resolution would basically be incredibly, you know, enhanced. Uh -huh. So you can really go to very, very, very small scale. So yeah, that was an excellent question. So I see that I know that some of my friends 
they are actually proposing some space space, you know, via BI. Uh, so really, we don't know. I mean, that depends on NASA. Hopefully, they get that finger crossed. But if even if it happens, maybe in the next ten, you know, years or so, there is no chance that we can get them. So another hands, yeah. So <clears throat> do all of these instruments need to observe the same object at the same time? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So and that's looks, exactly like the, the challenge. So yeah, because there's a very small window because you're yeah. rotating one degree every four minutes, right? Right. No, I mean you are correct actually. And that's exactly the reason that currently uh, the observations of the ESG is only one season around the March or April, that's exactly the time that, because the fact is that you don't want to, you know, you want that all of them really observe the same source at the same time. So it could be that the sunrise and sunset, you know, they should be matched and sometimes in some seasons, you actually see a weather which is cloudy, that means that you cannot really observe them, you know. So you have to have actually some, you know, uh, in a good, you have to be in a good condition that you really actually see them, especially for the Sagittarius star, which is in our own galaxy. So yeah, that's very limited. Is there any other question? Just you know, feel free to ask them because you know, I don't, I don't need to actually go through all of the slides, but I want that you understand and we appreciate you know the basically the techniques that people are using. So let me continue, but please stop me anytime. So right, so actually the idea of the interferometry that according to your question i'm very happy that everybody appreciated that this is really cool that was actually proposed a decade ago and the ehd collaboration has formed and thanks to it now we have a very uh, precise measurement of the emission of the black holes in the synchrotron and that's actually another interesting thing that i want to show you is the leader movie so, you know, I think that since this is nice, maybe people would love to actually see it. So let me stop. This is for actually Sagittarius star. We are going to see that how much true the interstellar medium, ESG was helping us out to go all the way through and remove all of those signals and model them actually and basically subtract them just to see the event horizon, you know, ring or actually the area. So I would just stop talking because then I would see the reflection of my son. And let me just actually play the movie. the difficulty of this observation and as you saw we had to remove all of the basically foregrounds that we actually observed according to the foreground of the galaxy but happily we are here and we actually have this beautiful basically ring that it doesn't really look very interesting you know it's not as smiley as m87 it was but you know that's still a good actually that's how the Sagittarius star look like so maybe this is upset that we have spent so many time and efforts to actually say but then um, yeah so basically what we learn from this actually analysis that's another very important things that i want to emphasize so the ESG not only was able to go to the vicinity of the event horizon telescope, sorry, event horizon of the black core, but, on, but also actually was able to capture the physics around the black core. So we all see that when we have accelerating electrons, they emit synchrotron emission, and there are a lot of theoretical basically analysis or actually predictions that they just try to see or just try to simulate how strong or weak would be the basically magnetic field around those uh, basically rotating electrons. But what is the geometry of the Sagittarius star? Is this going to be face onto us or is it actually going to be agent? We haven't observed any jet yet. 
So there were a lot of the questions about the basically temperature of the electrons, about the actually magnetic field, and a lot of other things that before the EHD results come basically to an exist, they were all ambiguous, and we really didn't know. So what people in the ESG have done was that we have a very big people that are actually expert on the theory, and you see that there are a lot of different models that each of them, maybe that was the entire career of the people to come up with. But then you have to, uh, basically thermal electrons when you actually have this thermal basically emission or non thermals. But then you have a stellar wave accretion, but then you have basically some strong magnetic field or actually weak magnetic field. So thanks to all of the huge people, about 40, 400 basically folks in the EHD collaboration, we gathered all of those simulations from different groups with different assumptions about the parameters, the electron temperature, basically the magnetic field structures, the geometry of those actually additions and so on. And we just tried to put them in a multi-frequency analysis around the Sagittarius star. And the results was actually very interesting. So as you see here, depending on what is the geometry, this is actually whether you are, whether you are actually having a black hole, which is the face onto you, or age on, we actually see that the structures of the ring and the emission and those multi-frequency analyses all the way from actually the radio to the X-ray would be different. So through the multi-frequency analysis, EHD was able to come up with a very interesting, actually, uh, you know, conclusion that you would actually see in this movie. So before I play it, this actually refers to all of different models that before EHD, they were equally important and they were equally actually respected. So people really didn't know what would be actually the geometry of the black hole, the magnetic field strength, the electron temperature, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but when ESG came to actually to exist, through the mass frequency analysis, that I'm not going to go all of through this, that will be entire of the other talk, we were able to actually quickly see that in terms, if you just consider the subs from the ESG, that were, you know, a lot of them would actually disappear. Now you go to the shape of the ESG, and then you go to the spectrum of those mass frequency analysis, and it's very interesting that if you actually also consider the basically low frequency, only two models would survive. So that's exactly what I'm going to emphasize. So the success of the ESG was that you actually can roll out almost all of the models that were otherwise equal and important. And you actually see that basically the vicinity of the black holes, they should be, they should have a strong magnetic field. Electrons are actually a little bit basically uh, cold and uh, they are actually about 10 to the not Kevin. And actually the geometry of the black holes is a little bit toward us. So that's actually, you know, that's the little basically picture that I can tell you. If this is the Earth, that would be basically what you are seeing. And there is misalignment between the basically, uh, you know, between the rotation angle of the, of the black hole versus the rotation angle of the galaxy. So that was again very interesting discovery that EHD made. So those radio telescopes, you see that those interferometry, they actually effort that we made to put all of those telescopes actually have paid up, paid back to us in terms of the understanding of what is going on in the visibility of the black hole, in terms of the electron distribution, in terms of the magnetic structures and the geometry of the black hole. So that actually brings me to the end of this basically part, which is the uh, radio part. And now we go to the actually to even more interesting thing, which is the James Webb Space Telescope. So let me ask you actually in the room, how many people are aware of James Webb? That's actually, okay, you can raise your hand. Okay, good, quite a few numbers. So that's very important. So that's actually a newly launched space, basically telescope that is gonna to see in the near IR uh, actually, and it's basically a lot of the science that in the next 20 years, maybe, we would actually be there with. That's about the formation of the stars, about the exoplanets, about the feedbacks actually from the black holes, about the seeds of the black holes, and all the way going to very high redshift that it was not possible before. So there are a lot of cool sciences that you can draw. So for instance, there is actually a very good team of the people from, from Harvard 
that are actually made by the Hubbard Church of the basically Hubbard Astronomy Church, Daniel Eisenstein, that is actually considering these jaders, which is the near camp, uh, basically near our, our camp, and that's actually beautiful images that they are not simulated, they are actually the real one. And all what we need to do is that, I already told you before I get to the actually telescopes, that we also have a good frameworks from the theory, from Lester CNG simulations that Lars and Quiz and other professors at Harvard University, they have been actually working on it for a decade. So we are in a very unique moment in the time that we can try to connect what we observe with what we actually model. So over here you see that there are some actually images of the galaxy that we could either observe them through stars or through the gas. And you see that a lot of those can be actually, you can actually consider the stars, you can consider their photometries, and you just try to actually compare them. So something that I want to emphasize is that, like what I said, how much the ejections of the materials you see from the black holes in terms of whether they are actually very powerful or they are less powerful. What is the orientation distributions of those ejections and so on? And actually the sections, how quickly actually black holes eject materials, they can all be hopefully tested using this fascinating approach, which has actually something to do with the structures that you actually see. You see that the morphologies of your basic galaxies would be different, the distributions of the gas would be different, their emission and absorptions that you actually see according to another fascinating recent papers that we wrote would be actually different. And all of them would put us in a golden time that we can try to actually, for the first time, try to see which of the models, which of the million different possibility for the models would actually end up to be correct. So we just try to understand and unpack what was the evolution of the universe back in many, many, many actually decades or actually, you know, billion years ago. So that's important. In addition, you can also consider when the universe was very young, what was the seed of the black holes, what is the mass of them, how much actually, how much was the original black hole that the universe started with, are they going to be, you know, large or going to be small, and how much they are actually accreting, what is the power that they are accreting, are they going to act very actively, or they are not very active. So all of these fascinating questions, about the structure formation, about the aging and feedback, about the basically strengths of those and so on, would hopefully be answered in some years by James Webb. And that's actually very compelling results. So with that note, let me go to the next basically band. And this band now actually considered to basically consider the optics. So SDSS, Sloan Digital Sky Survey did a great job of considering the basically optical, you know, that was an optical telescope, and it was actually trying to consider a lot of different galaxies and different morphologies. So basically, Lisa Kuri, who is the new director of the actually Smithsonian, they really did a great job back in time, and they just tried to classify the emission, the optical emission, from all of those different galaxies that you actually see them here. And not only they try to compute the emissions through some fascinating techniques that is beyond the scope of this talk, but they were also able to make a classification that has been a very standard tools in the community, and a lot of people basically consider them, and you can actually see that over a few thousand of the citations that this big paper actually got recently. So it's very important to see that when you consider the emission from all of different galaxies that you actually see them from STSS, how much you can actually see them? Are those galaxies that start forming or they are aging, meaning that they have an active black holes at their center? So you see that different diagnostics, optical diagnostic, they are able to actually unpack this very important question about whether your galaxy is a star forming, whether this actually hosts AGN, whether this is a composition that not only it actually has a star for me, but it also has a power fusion and so on. So that's very important. That's another lesson that we actually get when not be considered the optical telescopes. So that's actually another 
completely another model, completely another framework, but again, it actually allows us to unpack something about the structures of the specific galaxy, whether the host AGN or whether they are star forming. So together, along with the IR that I already spoke about, how the galaxies form, what is the star formation there, what is the actually, you know, strength of the black holes, the existence of the black hole versus the strength of the black hole, you know, the actual star formation, whether basically the current stage, whether they are star forming or not, that actually make, you know, make some sense to make, you know, to hopefully draw some pictures that this is the originate, this is the actual origin of the black holes in terms of their seed and whether your galaxy would actually actively host them and so on and so forth. So this is very important to consider those mass frequency analyses. And now let's go, actually let's just try to be even more crazy. And I'm going to add the Chandra X-ray telescope that in the last two decades, they did a great job with actually observing some of those outflows. Mm -hmm. And they actually, they were also hinting toward the AGM feedback, how energetic would be the gas spell out of your galaxy. And in this actually image, you see that this is overlaying the radio with the actually X-ray. So you see that basically the synergy between the radio and X-ray is very important and contains very important questions about the structures of the AGN, you know, about the accretion to the black hole, about the jet morphologies, jet launching, and so on and so forth. So not only that, you can also try to overlay them on the top of each other in which there is actually the Chandra. In addition to that, you have actually SKA, which is the radio, in terms of some contours on this map. And you can actually see that, quite interestingly, most of the time, the origin of the emission between the radio and X-ray are almost equal, which means that they are actually originating from the center of the galaxy, which is launched by the black hole. So this is, again, very compelling a story. You have a central black hole, it's actually going to emit energy, it's going to actually spare gas that can be observed through massive frequency. And then either, you know, you can just consider that radio actually emission is more sensitive to the magnetic field geometry, while the actually X-ray is more sensitive to the thermodynamics of the gas. So through this massive frequency, you can try to see how much is actually the synergy between the magnetic field geometry versus the gas thermodynamic. So that's actually another interesting view of those aging feedback that you actually can see them through this massive frequency analysis. Next in the basically in the table is Fermi gamma ray that is actually over here. Let's see what we understand if you consider the Fermi actually telescope in the gamma ray. This is beautiful. According to the recent simulations, we actually consider to have some expelling of the gas from the inner part to the outer part. And that's actually in the gamma ray that basically is exhibited itself in terms of some bubbles. So quite interestingly, in a recent Nature paper, Fermi collaboration was able to basically discovered those Fermi bubbles that was actually confirming the existence and presence of the AGM feedback in the Milky Way. So that's very compelling, just a moment. And that actually allows us to directly compare what you actually basically consider or what you expect from your uh, simulations and also from the observation. So I see a question here. Uh, how do you distinguish the, these apparently are parts of, you think of the jets from the from the AGN when it was an AGN a long time ago, right? But yeah. I distinguish that from, from bubbles caused by large numbers of supernovas early in the history of the galaxy. Yeah, that's a good question. To be honest with you, I'm not an observer, so that, that's a really great question. I'm sure that they have actually, I think that what you can actually, okay, I don't know the answer, I don't want to say something wrong, but my guess is that you know, again, those theoretical modeling is actually very useful. So we have some people of us, basically Ido Berger, another professor in Harvard University, they really go and do all of these theoretical supernovae actually explosions and modelings and so on. So I think that very cleverly they have enough basically confidence of what would be the morphology of the bubbles that are coming from, you know, coming from the ejections out of the supernovae or from actually the AGM feedback. And that's exactly what I wanted to mention. So that was a great timing that in this case, 
basically theoretical simulations that again I started with those cosmological simulations or even Zoe simulations with higher resolution allow us so they would be actually our basically uh, you know our guideline to really see what you really actually expect to see and it's very interesting because at first you actually see the cartoon because that was the expectation that you would and you should really see those basically Fermi bobbers and maybe through some you know some crazy mechanisms that it actually happens in the universe and then the Fermi actually satellites was able to actually observe them. So again, that's another synergy that you actually see. A basically, you, you really expect to see a basically outflow because of the presence of the, you know, of the AGN at your center, black hole at your center, which is actively accreting, you know, materials, and you actually observe them through the observation. So that's beautiful, isn't it? So all of them actually gives us basically a hand to what is the elephant in the room. So I hope that now you're convinced that it's very important to combine the radio with the actual near IR, with basically the optical telescopes, with the X-ray and gamma ray. And as you actually, I hope that as we actually, you know, uh, acknowledge, it's, it's really hard and different telescopes are going to actually answer different questions. So it's really important to see how much you're gonna to basically converge them, how, how much you're gonna to combine them. And that's exactly the idea of multi-frequency analysis that a lot of people are actively thinking about that, just to see how much you can actually try to connect all of different elephants in the room that is in this case in the space, as you see in the foreground of this picture. So I stop here, I think that my time is also uh, up. So please uh, ask me any other questions. I will be happy to have more discussions with you. Thank you so much. Mark Was Helton, I on time Helton. or? Uh... Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, good. Mark Helton online. Go ahead, Mark. Hey, hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me? You can hear me okay. Okay, great. Uh, this is maybe a basic question that I should maybe know an answer to, but which came first, uh, the galaxy or the egg? The uh, Did the black hole create the galaxy or when, when, all, when all of the gases combined from, you know, the in the early universe, did that create a black hole, which is then since created? Because not all galaxies are spiral. We saw IC10. Right. So, but that's, you know, I don't think that this is a basic question at all, because that's exactly something that people really work actively. So that's actually black hole six that we really don't know. There are different paradigms on actually what is the coevolution of the black holes and actually and they're basically and their host galaxies. And you know, you could have the black hole six for me very, very, very early on. And of course, when they have formed that, we don't, we don't really know what is the origin of those seeds, but you just assume them, right? Then you can actually try to see that, okay, they grow, they accrete further and further and further gas, and at some point they actually convert it to the galaxy. Or you could also try to say that, okay, they have been very little black holes at all, but then, you know, at some points, throughout the entire of the galaxy evolution, they also get grow and so on. So I think that that's a very good question, and that's exactly something that I try to actually address in terms of the synergy and co-evolution of the black holes and their actually host galaxy. That we don't really know what is the original actually seed of the black holes and what is their accretion rate. Of course, if they are super active and they're accreting very fast and they're activating actually a large amount of the materials, they are going to almost, you know, overcome the evolution of their basically galaxy. And in another word, they're actually going to, to form the galaxy in this way. But really, in terms of when you put those seeds, that is, again, another theory, you know, uh, it's actually, it's a hot question to my sense. And I can tell you what people do in terms of the cosmological simulations that you actually try to, by hand, put a black or seed because you cannot really resolve them. So you could just say that if your hello mass exceeding some actually original threshold, then you put a black hole at the center of it. So you see, again, I mean, don't worry, this is not a basic question, but hopefully 
by the actually advantage of having the James Webb, we would be able to you know, answer this question uh, one way or the other because those actually thinning of the black holes and accretion, hopefully when we get more and more data, we may get more actually confident whether they are going to have those actually M sigma relation that's prepared basically and briefly basically pro for the local universe, whether they are going to get deviated from it, and you know what is the circumstances for which you know for this or that actually. So I hope that answer your question. Okay. Yeah, there is a question. That, here. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Just a quick question about this right. slide here. I was looking at this uh, graph when you had it up. Why why does the area mark quasars have such a sort of a, a unique Step shape to it? Yeah. Why why isn't that a smooth sort of transition. What's that step? It looks like a redshift, maybe a little over two. That horizontal line. Oh, you mean you mean this line? Which one no, is this the, one? Yes. Why does yeah. it why does it look funny to the left of the yeah, I think actually, I think that it's actually, it has something to do with the quasars that are very super massive, you know, that actually, I mean, that's not, the accretions are basically, you know, pointed with the lines that you are saying here. So I think what it actually refers to is that you really see them, you know, these are the basically, uh, you know, super massive black holes that are very highly massive, right? So yeah, it's actually, I think that it's just, it's, it's just animation, you know. So it's not real data, it's just... No, I'm no, no, I mean, no, yeah, they said that no, it's on a black hole here. So it's just, I mean, um, okay, as you ask me, let me ask you, let me tell you why we actually have this and why this is important. Quite recently, there were some discoveries of black holes that they actually deviate from empirical M sigma relation that has something to do with the coevolution of the supermassive black holes and their host galaxies. So then, that was a question. Then the question arose that what is the accretion rate to the black hole or what is the black hole seed, you know, that actually refers to in the very, very high redshift, redshift of 20 or something, how actually, how basically active your galaxy, your, your, your black hole was in terms of accreting materials and so on. So I think that it actually is just depicted, you know, something that you see like your quasars, you know, that is like in low redshift that you see them today with this basically, you know, like a threshold for the black hole mass that they should be above this range. So I think that that actually refers to the fact that you haven't seen anything, you know, anything like less than 10 to the 7 basically. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. But you know, otherwise we would just like trying to really show that if you actually change the you know locations of those you know seeking black holes and actually they cover what would be the what would be the consequence at low redshift? For instance, if they are very 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 you know ac basically active in terms of accretion, they will be very 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 massive today. That is that is far fetched. But I think what he's asking about is actually specifically why there's a cutoff line right here. Why is that? Isn't that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the problem is that we haven't observed them. So in this case, you are correct that they just try to actually put in terms of some animated, you know, data points. So if we were lucky to actually see them here, of course, that was continue. So in this case, this is an empirical, you know, basically diagram, which is just like, you know, basically painted what you have seen in terms of the seeds versus the actual redshift. Any other question? I hope you are not too tired. <laughs> so, uh, what's what are the units of Eddington? Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's actually you know it's basically I think ten to forty five or something. Yeah, so, that's okay. actually in oh sorry, it's in terms of the air per second. That's actually accretion rate. Okay. But it also depends on the black hole mass. So this is actually a uh, linearly proportional to the black hole mass. Yeah, I can I can show you. So it really depends. So yeah, that's a great question. So this is egg per second because you know that's the flux that you actually see. But um, but yeah, it it, it really depends on the black hole okay. mass and so on. Yeah. Is, is one is one Eddington uh, kilometer per you know magnetic field or what are the what are the units? Earth mass per second. Three Mass per billion years How much energy you accrete per second? 
yeah. in terms of egg. Right. Yeah, but what's one egg? Oh, <clears throat> it depends um, upon depends upon which vessel the cold. Right. Yeah, right, but like it's, one, a, it's a general relativistic like specific. I, I, I can sit there and compute it for you if you like. Or is it like a <laughs> bowl or an amp or a. Oh, I can, a I can, I can quickly show you after this stuff. Thing. No, I mean, that's a good question. The fact is that we have a crazy unit, you know, because, you, I mean, I didn't show, I didn't actually present the Bondi, which is like a quadratic in terms of black mm -hmm. hole mass, and, you know, and most of the time people try to. I mean, why this is important, I can actually tell you that uh, there is basically a comparison that you can make between the Bondi accretion, which is the quadratic in terms of the mass of black hole versus the actually Eddington accretion. So these are all depending on the actually on the basically mass of the black hole and really the transition that you go from you know from the star forming to the quiescent galaxies really has something to do according to our theories, you know, basically the comparison or actually how to say like the, the ratio of them, which of them is going to uh, basically exceed the other would uh, potentially determine to some degree whether you are star forming or not. So yeah, that's the, that's a little bit technical, but it's very easy. I mean, I can just quickly show it to you. Yeah. Any other questions? So it's isotropic. It's like a solar mass per second. Uh, there's no other questions.